Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Spartan Forge. On today's episode, I am joined by Maine resident and deer hunter, Jameson Grady. So Jameson is a listener of the podcast and has been submitting Mountain Buck Monday stories over the last three years of some giant Maine bucks by tracking in the snow, including a 172-inch mammoth buck this past November. So on today's episode, we discuss hunting in Maine, learning from signpost rubs, the story of his 2022 buck, how to read a track, where to start tracking, the speed in which you track, off-season scouting, and much more. On this week's Mountain Buck Monday Story of the Week, we have a story coming from last season from Jared Schaefer in West Virginia. So Jared wrote in, in late October 2021, I randomly got access to a 100-acre piece of property not far from my home in northern West Virginia. I made a quick scouting trip to an isolated saddle connecting the heavy cover to a mid-elevation bench and found some great sign. Fast forward to the first day of rifle season and I slowly slipped back to that spot for an afternoon sit. After getting set up, I noticed a super fresh scrape not 20 yards from me, a good sign. At 4.15, I spotted movement on the bench and spotted the biggest buck I've ever seen in West Virginia. He offered me a quick 60-yard shot, and I dropped him on the spot. He turned out to be my biggest buck ever at 153 inches, just a perfect 10-pointer with great character. It was a hunt that I'll never forget. So Jared has is just consistently successful with killing good deer in West Virginia and really any state that he goes to. Jared works for Tethered and uh, is just an absolute animal. I'd put bets on him anywhere he goes uh, to get it done. So congratulations, Jared, and thanks for submitting that story. If you want to see the photo of that buck, head over to East Meets West Hunt on Instagram, East Meets West Outdoors on Facebook, and you can check those out. So other than that, uh, we got deer season in full swing here in Pennsylvania. This week, I am out with the Seek One boys, Lee and Drew, and we're going to be doing some some deer hunting in the big woods, kind of showing these guys around and teaching them uh, the ways of the big woods and just doing a little bit of ground hunting and seeing if, uh, if we can get a buck or two down in a, a three and a half day stint, basically. So I'm excited for those guys to come up. I really enjoy hanging out with them and, uh, yeah, excited to see how it goes, uh, with, with them here in the big woods. So other than that, uh, I hope everyone is having a good start to December here and I will talk to you next week. All right. We're live. Jameson Gray. Welcome to the podcast, man. Hey, thanks, Bo. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited, uh, <laughs> excited to have you on you, you and I have talked, uh, back and forth on uh, the Instagram there for a few years now. You've been sending in some Mountain Buck Monday submissions, and and uh, there was a pattern to these. They were coming in every year, and they were big yep. deer and, and uh, some, some big woods main bucks, and I, I was uh, I was <clears> glad <throat> that you accepted uh, the invitation to be able to come on. Yeah, sure. Uh, happy to be on. Uh, glad I got the invite. Uh, my first podcast, so. Really? Breaking the, you're break, yeah, it was the first one I've ever done. Nice. So, uh, yep. Yeah, my name's uh, Jameson Grady. Uh, born and raised in the mid-coast area of Maine, which is the southern half of the state. And, uh, yeah, I got a wife. I got two little kids. I'm a logger by profession. Uh, what else? Let's see. Uh, brain trees here. <laughs> well, you, you're but, uh, being, a, being a logger. You're you're uh, you're known where some of the good spots are right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, it definitely helps. We usually cut. Uh, we're more of the cut down state, which is the it's mostly small, smaller parcels of land. Like here, usually like a big parcel of land down here is only 100, 200 acres. Okay. So we don't usually cut too much up in the big woods. It's about the big woods from my house is about a two hour drive. Okay. But we do. We just bought a some land up there and built a little cabin so i've been venturing up there to deer hunt more the last 
five or six years. Nice. Is that is that kind of yeah. like the is that kind of the tradition for you? Like growing up, did you hunt the big woods, or what was it kind of like your your hunting background? No, nope. no. Growing up, uh, probably the first twenty years of my deer hunting, I just hunted right around the town I grew up in, and uh, did that for a long time. Uh, I started hunting when I was ten. The legal age to deer hunt in Maine is ten, and uh, I shot my first deer. It was a doe. When I was 11 years old, I was uh, still hunting solo, which from, wasn't quite legal back then. But <laughs> my dad, my father used to just set me free in the woods and uh, I'd kind of bounce around. And I was always kind of the guy that was still hunting and trying to stock up on deer. And so opening day when I was 11, I still hunted up, saw a nice doe and got her. And then when I was uh, 12, or might have been 13, I can't really remember I uh, opened the day again, got my first buck. I was still hunting again solo. Uh, saw a nice little five pointer with a doe and uh, got him. And then for years, I just kept hunting around home. And we kind of had like a, my family's all big into deer hunting. So mm -hmm. we would all hunt around the house. We had set stands. and But I've never been the guy that likes to sit. Like I've always been a roamer, bounce around the woods still hunt rarely we rarely would get snow here and uh so i never really got into tracking until i'll be six or seven years ago i started the tracking game and uh now it's that's all i want to do it just the way to go i think yeah <laughs> for me yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's and that's um so you're saying like in the the more the northern main woods is where you get the snow that you can that yeah you can do the tracking yeah down around my house we probably only get snow once or twice a year and it's usually like thanksgiving week or we have a muzzleblower season after our uh, rifle season ends and usually those two weeks first weeks of december you get a good chance to get snow but we don't get a lot of snow down here, but you start going up north, two hours north of here, and then even up above that. I mean, the whole month of November, there's a pretty good chance you'll get some tracking snow to work with. So, yeah, yeah, I started doing that. Um, I was just gonna ask, but before you get into that, what, how does like, how does Maine's hunting season run? Like, if you were to go from the beginning of deer season, is it start yep. out with an archery season, or how how does that how does that work? Yep, October 1st, our archery season starts, and then that runs the entire month of October. And then usually right around the last Saturday in October, we have our residence day, and that's when our rifle season starts. And then our rifle season is four weeks long. It runs till the Saturday after Thanksgiving, and then that ends. And then we have a two-week muzzleloader season in the southern zones, and the northern zone only has a one-week muzzleloader season because the deer start yarding up and then up north once you get into december usually the snow starts to pile up and all the deer start to head to like their yarding areas and into towns where they spend the winter so they shut it off so the deer don't get hammered too bad when they get on those migration trails and stuff you, but, you know it's funny i i had not heard of that until i talked to a guy last year that was from the adirondacks and was talking about mm -hmm. how they go on these migration trails and they they start yep. yarding up i mean we don't get the, that kind of level of snow where we're at where they just you know where they have to migrate they, they might move to different areas but not not at the levels that it sounds like that that you guys deal with yeah i mean it used to be it used to be a ton of deer yards up north but without our entire northern half of our state is pretty much owned by uh, uh, like paper companies and large landowners that have uh, you know a vested interest in the timber. So they started cutting a lot of the deer yards. So the deer kind of lost their normal wintering area. So they started venturing into towns because people started feeding them. Because everyone loves the deer in northern Maine, you know. Yeah. We don't have a lot of them, so. <laughs> we're trying to keep what we they have up there so all the deer they'll go for they'll come for 20 miles look them down out of the mountains they'll come down into the towns and a lot of them will spend the winters there i mean a lot of the big bucks they'll spend their winters out on a mountaintop by themselves but 
that's just most of the most of the does and young deer they they travel to some sort of yard or town or something like that i was gonna ask that if the if the the big old mature bucks if they still like went along those patterns or if they just kind of lived up yeah, on their some, own some of them will go to town but a lot of times those big bucks they like to be by themselves. You know, they're just kind of loners and they'll stay out. They'll stay out by themselves, but. Ah, interesting. Yep. No, yep. that's, that's super <clears throat> cool. But how did you get into, uh, I guess the, the tracking aspect and wanting to kind of get into the, the big woods style of hunting? Yeah. Well, yeah, like I said, about five or six, six or seven years ago, I, uh, I always thought it'd be a really cool way to hunt and I really wanted to try it and, I'll tell, I'll tell everyone right now that if you're really interested in tracking and big woods hunting, pretty much one of the best things you can do is get Hal Blood's book, Big Woods Buck, Hunting Big Woods Bucks Volumes 1 and 2. I mean, a lot of us consider it like the tracking Bible when it comes to hunting deer. I mean, I read those books and that got me started. And then I started going up there and doing it on my own. And I just fell in love with it. I was like, this is this is so much fun you know you get to see just my favorite thing about big woods hunting is i love seeing a new piece of woods for the first time and you really never know you can start out a day and you really never know what you're going to see you never know where you're going to go it's just it's a blast really yeah so. no that's that's super <clears throat> cool i mean i um i'm actually going to get those books and read them this winter uh we don't we don't get uh, a ton of time as far as being able to, to track um in at least where i'm at in pennsylvania but there are some years during our gun season and then especially during our late flintlock uh muzzleloader and late archery season but when you can carry a flintlock and after christmas into january when you can definitely track and one of my my good buddies johnny stewart does that a lot and it's mm -hmm. it's like it's my grandpa used to do it when we used to get a lot more snow during gun season he was big on tracking and has taught me a lot about it i just haven't done it a ton myself but it's super interesting to me and i've had hal on here before uh getting to talk to him and and it's just i like the aspect too of just like you said getting to see different country and just mm -hmm. i that's why I, I like scouting more than i like hunting because i like walking around where this yeah. is like you, you can kind of combine the both of them yeah i mean that's pretty much what we do early season up in the big woods when there's no snow we just still hunt around like i've gotten to the point now where i i never sit in a tree stand i never sit at all really the most i'll sit is like maybe an hour in a spot if i think it looks good but if it's bare, if it's bare ground, there's no snow. I'm just covering ground and I'm looking for sign. I'm trying to find that next big buck. So when it does snow, I can go in that area and try to cut his track and then track him down. I mean, if I run into him when I'm bare ground, I'm going to kill him. But yeah, you know, <laughs> that's just how I love scouting. It yeah, scouting so much fun. I've gotten to the point where spring scouting, I love that now. And pre season during archery season, I don't archery hunt. All I do is gun hunt which really the main reason why is we only get one buck tag here in Maine. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a homebody. I've never hunted out of state. I've only hunted Maine my entire life. So that one buck tag is so precious. And November is just tradition to me. And stuff. so I wait till gun season. So no October, I just scout around and bird hunt and bear hunt. And yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you, um, when you, when you scout, what, like, what are you looking for as far as to be able to help you when you're tracking? Like, what are you looking for when you're scouting? Uh, some of the biggest thing I'm looking for, I'm looking for scrapes if they're around. Usually they don't, usually they don't pop up till late October. And, uh, one of the biggest ones up here, which Hal writes about in his book, is the signpost rubs. They're, man, they are the key to finding those big bucks. They just, if you never, have you heard much about signpost rubs? Yeah. So actually we have, um, I mean, we have signpost rubs that, that I'll find in some of the areas they are very few and far in between, but I started running cameras on them probably about yep. five years ago and I've learned so much. And actually after talking to Hal, that's when I really started putting them on and just understanding how they use them. And what I learned was like, 
these bucks they might not hit that rub you know they might only work that actual rub maybe once a year you know maybe only one buck will touch it but all the bucks like to come through that area it's like it's almost like a community scrape aspect where they'll come up and they'll sniff it and they'll move along and i have there's i mean i probably have close to a dozen marked in my maps right now that Mm -hmm. that i i know where they're at and i i pay attention to that because it even at all points of the year they'll they'll come by those that rub and it's just kind of a a a travel area what what have you noticed with them as far as where you're at yeah a lot of the same things uh yeah usually about late october first week or two of november that's usually when they hit them and uh, they'll come in, sh- give them a good shine. And I actually have a really nice video on my Instagram of a big buck in an area I found last year. Found a nice signpost. Actually, there was three signposts all together in this little swaley spot. And, uh, yeah, I got a nice eight-point buck. Comes down, shines up the signpost, keeps going. And yeah, then I had, him, I had him there on cam. He'd come through, like, once a week early season just come through that area, you know, like send check it. There was some does in there. So obviously, you know, he was checking for them, but uh, yeah, I'm interested to get back up, check that camera again. But yeah, we love running the cams on the signpost. But like I said, usually it's, usually it's early November, late October. And if I was going to sit a signpost first week of November, if I was going to sit, I don't know yeah. much of a sitter, but if you were going to sit first week of November on a signpost, good spot. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 cool, and 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 you got to run the cameras on video mode on signposts oh. because, yeah, yeah. I, I got so there was this buck actually I was telling you before we were uh, recording a uh, buck that I've hunted for the last three years that just got killed during gun season, but he would his the signpost rub that he would visit. It, every t- I would go there and I would freshen up the rub by spraying forehead gland scent on the rub. And mm-hmm. within 24 hours of me being there, every single time he would show back up. It wouldn't be, you know, one time it was an hour after I left in daylight, other times the middle of the night, but he'd come through and he would just get mad <laughs> and just shred oh, yeah. that tree, just, you know, just running up and down it. And I'm like, it was just so cool to, to see that and how they use that, uh, territorially really. It's, it, it was pretty neat. Yeah. I don't want to have blood theories on the science folks is that it's kind of like a, it's kind of like where one buck's territory overlaps another buck's territory. So they'll have this little spot where they can kind of keep tabs and they, it's kind of like, Oh, this is my side. This is your side. Or, you know, they kind of just share it, but it's kind of, it's cool. Yeah. No, yeah. That, that is interesting. And, and do you, do you use cameras a lot? I run a few, I run like 10 cameras, mostly all up in the big woods. And yeah, not really for hunting. Just, I just love to see you know, what might be out there. And yeah, but my cameras this year kind of led me to this. Well, we'll get into the big buck. That yeah, I got this no, year, just, but just, he kind of just roll in. Yeah, you know, he kind of led me to this spot because I've been running the cameras. Like I said, I found this spot up near where our camp is uh, last year, found the signpost. So this summer, about August, I went in, put a, put a cam on that signpost. And then I found another heavy use trail with a scrape. Then I put another camera on and I went back and checked them late October. And I had a really nice eight and a really nice 10 pointer. Both of them were nice bucks, shoot, shooter bucks for me. And uh, they were uh, both what I considered over 200 pounds, which is the, I know a lot of states, you guys don't even weigh your deer, but up here in Maine, that's like the, everyone, that's the first thing they ask you. No one even cares what the antlers are like. They're like, yeah. what did it weigh? What did it weigh? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I had these two really nice bucks in there. So uh, once I saw snow in the forecast for the third week of our gun season, and uh, I was like, I got to go in and try to track one of these bucks. Cause they're in there, and they've been in there. One of them been in there once a week pretty much the entire season. And the other one I only had like one or two pictures of, but I knew he was in the area because I had pictures of him from the previous year also during the rut. So he was around. I just wasn't picking him up on cameras. So I made plans to go up there. I saw snow in the forecast. And I went up on a... I left early, early on a Wednesday morning. It was uh, it just started to snow that morning. But I wanted 
snow there was snow coming it was the first of the year i had to be in there usually on a snowstorm day it's, it's really hard to get a deer find a deer trap because they kind of hunker down when it snows but i was like i have to do it anyway i don't care i'll so i busted around all morning that morning during the snowstorm uh ran into a small bull bull moose but that was about it on that area where i had the two bucks so i left there and went to another spot and just kind of scouted around and tried to try to kick something up that's really all you can do when it's snowing and you're just trying to run into something and get it on its feet so i did that all day and never really found much so i went back to camp and spent the night at our camp that night and uh the next morning i was going to get up i like to get up probably two or three hours before daylight and just uh because up here all our we have so many dirt roads on the paper company lands and you can just travel around all these pieces of woods and just check for tracks. So instead of instead of waiting till daylight, you just drive around and hope to cut a big buck track from the truck because it saves you a lot of footwork if you can find a buck track from the road mm-hmm. at first light. So I got in my truck and I started driving all the dirt roads around camp and uh, I was seeing tons of small tracks, which which is kind of abnormal for up there. Like so. It's not a lot of deer, but this year it seems to be good. We've had two really easy winters the last two years. So our deer population up a little bit from what it usually is. So I've seen tons of small tracks, does, skippers, young bucks, but I wasn't finding that big track. I'm like, damn, I'm like, where are these bucks? You know, I was like, it was it's the middle of November. The rut's cranking. I'm like they gotta be here somewhere. So I kept driving and driving. I'd been in the truck probably two hours and Probably it was quite a ways from that spot where I had those bucks, but I don't know, probably five miles beyond that area. I caught this really nice buck track coming into the road. And I'm like, Oh, this looks pretty good. Biggest track I'd seen on one. I'm like, this is a good buck. He didn't have the biggest foot on him, but I figured he was a 200 pound buck. So when well, he came into the road and then he started traveling straight down the road. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess we're gonna just track you in the truck for a minute. <laughs> and he went, he went about a mile right down the dirt road. And I'm like, all right, he's covering ground, like he's taking the path of least resistance here. So I'm like, yeah, he, he's out looking for those. So I followed him a mile, and I finally he cut into the woods. And I parked my truck right there, and it was still probably 15 minutes before legal shooting. So I just sat out, hung out in the truck, and drank some water and got ready because you never know what kind of day you're in for. Yeah. Sometimes it can be a, sometimes it can be a 10 to 15 mile day. So you've got to get hydrated and get ready. And uh, so I parked right there and got out when it got daylight and I started tracking him. And the first mile he made eight scrapes. And so I'm like, okay, he was just, he was just keeping a line nice and straight heading somewhere but he made he kept stopping to make a scrape and i'm like oh it's good because whenever they do some something like that you're gaining time on them when you're tracking them so he did that for the first mile and then all of a sudden he made an abrupt turn and whenever they make an abrupt turn something usually they, usually they smell something or they're going to bed down if they've held a straight line for a long time and they make an abrupt like 90 degree turn you know they found something so I slowed down a little bit and tracked it, followed his track, and he went straight down back towards the road. He was kind of parallel on the road. He went straight down and ran straight into a doe and a fawn. I could see where the doe and the fawn were bedded, and he kind of got them up out of their beds. And he did like one little circle, chased them around. And that doe must not have been in heat because he immediately left the doe and went straight back to the road that I started him on. And he ran right back down the road for another half a mile. <laughs> so this, this guy, this guy was cruising. And I'm like, wow. And really, I should have just continued down that road in my vehicle to make sure he hadn't crossed back across. But I was so anxious to get on the track that I just started him there. But anyway, yeah. So we went another half a mile straight down this road, and the road came to a T, and he went straight across. And across that T, it went down. It was a big brook. And a bunch of like a softwood, steep softwood ridge. Mm-hmm. 
And down in there, there was like two or three does. And he just chased, you could see in the snow where he just chased them all around. And I was kind of expecting to catch him right there because it was, he just looked like one of those spots where deer will love to bed on those side hills in the softwoods in some cover, especially when it's snowing or the snow on the trees. They'll just kind of bed on those hills. And, uh, but they weren't there. He'd chase them around and I could see where he went down. He crossed the brook. He went up on the bank and he stopped and he looked like he just stood there and smelt the air for a minute and he just didn't find what he looked. I don't know if he thought he chased a, a doe ran across there or what, but he doubled back, went straight back across the brook and went up back up the ridge towards the road that he crossed. And uh, it was like three or four sets of tracks that ran back across that road. And they went up on this higher, higher ridge up above the, the river and uh i got up in there and there was just deer tracks going every um, which way you could imagine he kept double backing on himself i was trying to track him i was getting so frustrated because it was just amazing tracks and when it gets like that there's one of two options really i mean you can either start just still hunting because if you think they're right there because you if you're just staring at tracks all the time, you're going to, you're going to miss the deer. You're going to jump them up and they're going to be gone. So you almost have to just start. If you believe they're right there, which I did, you almost just have to start still hunting. The other option is if you don't think they're there, you can circle around all those tracks and try to find where they come out the other side. So I started still hunting and, uh, I hadn't gone more than I'll say, I'll tell you before this was, about 9.30. I'd been, this was three miles on the track we'd gone so far. But this was about 9, 9.30. So I started still hunting, and uh, I hadn't gone more than 200 yards. And I look up through the woods, and I just see a deer's body silhouetted on the, on the snow. And I'm like, oh, right there, the deer. And uh, so I, I carry – what I use tracking is uh, – it's a marlin – 1895 lever action with a peep sight. Nice. So, yeah, but I carry a little set of binoculars in my pocket, just a little small set, like a 10 by 26 or whatever they are. And uh, I pulled them out and I looked at it and I moved ahead and I'm like, oh, that's a doe. Okay. All right. I'm like, I know there's, there's got to be a buck right here. He's been chasing these does all morning. He's got to be right here. So, I know more than I said, I can take a few more steps and try to improve my angle and vision on these deer because it was pretty quiet. You could get around pretty good. So I took two or three more steps and I looked up and just right behind her, that big buck just came into the picture. And with just with my eyes, all I could see was a big main beam coming out. And I'm like, oh, couldn't tell. I knew he was a big buck, but I didn't realize exactly how big he was. Judging by his track, I thought he was around 200 pounds. But you never know what that rack's going to be when you're tracking them. You're, yeah. just trying to find the, you're just trying to find the biggest track you can. And uh, so I came up with my rifle, and he was walking behind the doe. And when he came behind, behind these trees and I got a good shot, I fired. And I hit him a little high, and it broke his back and dropped him right there. And I, I took off running as fast as I could to get up there. And uh, he was up on his front legs, but one more, sh I gave him one more shot and that was the end of it. And then I walked up on him and I was like, holy moly, what did I just do? Cause <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Explain, was, explain, uh, explain how big that deer was, like what he looked like. And I'll, I'll share oh, some I, pictures with the podcast. I have him right here. I have him right here. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's see it on the video. Yeah. So he's a, he's a 12 pointer. He's a mainframe. He's like a 10 pointer, but he's got stickers. Oh <laughs> my gosh. So this is, yeah, that's him right there. Oh my <laughs> gosh. There's, and he has no brow tines. No, he has no brow tines. And he only has a 16 inch inside spread, but his mass and time <laughs> length is just crazy. We gross scored him. I had a friend who's a taxidermist and uh, he gross green scored him at 172 and change. But yeah, oh he's got just about gosh. like six inch mass all the way 
from his bases out to his G4s here. Yeah, it looks yep. like a just, it's like a, I don't, like a sword the whole way out. Like, I don't even know how yeah. else to yeah, explain it. Yeah, he's got this, the big bladed G2. Yeah. Just, just gnarly deer. Oh but. my gosh, that deer is beautiful. Yeah, and he, yeah. yeah, he's just, he's got mass the whole way through. He's got yep. character to him. Yeah, just no brows. He's got one little brow. <laughs> I've <laughs> never seen brow, that. Yeah. If he had brows and a little bit nicer spread, he'd be Boone and Crockett's for sure. Oh my but gosh! I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain too much. <laughs> no, that that is yeah. just I I yeah. His points mm -hmm. almost like even when you have him sitting back there, like his main beams almost come together. Yeah, they almost touch. There's yeah. only like. I don't know, five inches, six inches between the main beams. But, yeah, I was just, I couldn't believe it really when I pulled him. He had ha half his rack was shoved under the snow, and I it almost looked like he was broke off, and I'm like, oh, no. But <laughs> I, I pulled him out of the snow, and I was just like, because I've been on a three-year streak, really. I got this guy up here in 2020. I call him Pretty Boy. I actually shot him right near my where I live. Uh, my brother runs quite a few cameras, and he got him in, on camera uh, pretty steady that year. And, uh, yeah, I found a spot where there was a – actually found a signpost. I've been hunting this area for years, and I found this signpost that I didn't even know was there. And uh, I was going to go in and set a camera one day. It was early November. Actually, it was Veterans Day in 2020. So I went in there and set a can. I was going to set a camera on that. It was like 65, 70 degrees. I don't know if you remember 2020, yeah, the first I, couple I weeks. It was so hot. I remember hot. that week. Yeah, it was, it was terrible. so hot. <laughs> so I, yeah, kind of like this year, the first two weeks. But uh, yeah, I went in there and I put a camera up and I was like, I'll just sit here for a couple hours. And uh, that guy come moseying down the trail right by that signpost. So really? I got, he scored, yeah, he girl scored 152. But I called him Pretty Boy because he's a, he was a young deer. He only weighed 175 dress, and we're pretty sure he was max four, and we think he might have been only three years old, which is – Really? I didn't age him, and I didn't get a tooth. I wish I did, but he just looks like such a young deer with really good genetics, you know. When we first got pictures of him, like, that deer needs another year. Everyone <laughs>, laughs at me. I'm like, that deer needs another year. He's going to be a giant in a couple of years, but – in Maine, I couldn't pass him off. No. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. 150, you know, 150 inch deer. It's huge. Pretty, they're around Maine, but there's not a lot of them. No. So, uh, yeah, I got got him in 2020. And then last year, on the last day of rifle, I tracked another big buck and got him. And he scored 148 and changed. Holy Gross. cow. Yeah. So I've had a really nice three-year streak uh yeah i and, uh, i would say so yeah. but yeah the, a lot of it the rack size is a little bit of luck but because you never know when you're tracking them because the last two i've got tracking but well a little hard work a little luck and you never know what can happen yeah no that's 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 just that's incredible and it's funny because that one that you have on the wall behind you and again for anybody that wants to see him go on uh the youtube and watch the, the video version of the <laughs> podcast but that one is a giant rack but when you look at him his mass oh. compared to the one that said that you shot this year it, yeah, it's not even close. it's not even comparable like it's not yeah, i used to i used to think he was a big deer and now i look at the one I, i'm like oh geez. <laughs> <laughs> he looks small now but, I, I know he's got such a big frame on him that the one on the wall like just like he like you said he's got the the yeah. frame of a just yeah uh, um, a mega right. giant yeah um, two more years i think <laughs> <laughs> there's there's not there's not an ounce in me that would be able to uh, I know. let let I him know. walk at that point that's just um that's just a, a, a incredible deer but yeah it's 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 crazy that not crazy but it's incredible that you've had you know the success that you've had those last few years especially with tracking you know when you don't know because i i what i've learned of from talking to people from maine and it's kind of similar to the way it is in pennsylvania where you can get a really old deer that doesn't have a giant rack size 
you know, oh, I mean, yeah. I've, there's, there's a, a buck. I'm going to tilt my computer here a little bit. That one that's on the wall behind me scored 125 inches and he was nine and a half years old. He was 14, yeah. inch, 14 inches wide, just heavy yeah. old deer. And, and he was a little bigger the year before. Um, but he wasn't, he was never, he was never, uh, you know, 150 inch deer. Like that's just some of yeah. them just don't get to that level. No, definitely. No, they, yeah. Every year up here in the Northwoods, they shoot, they shoot some monster deer that are five, six year old deer. And they'd be lucky if they go a hundred inches, but, you know, they yeah. just, they just don't have the genetics. It's every once in a while you just get one of these deer that they're almost like genetic, genetic freaks. And just awesome deer. But, there, there's a, there's an area in Pennsylvania. I've, I've told this story before, but I, I'd found, I tried to find the most remote areas and I was like, I'm going to find the biggest deer. That was like my thought. And I went into this area and it was almost four miles to get back to this ridge system. And I found this giant signpost rub. I mean, it was just like year after year getting pounded and I ran camera on it and there were some other scrapes around, I ran cameras the whole year. And I never ended up actually hunting it, but I went back and pulled all the cameras and the biggest deer I got was probably 105 inches, but he looked like he was so deathly old. Like he had pop cam bases on him, <laughs> but he was just a little rack. And, and what I learned yeah. there was just the food wasn't, there wasn't much for browse or anything. They weren't logging in there. There wasn't really much to, mm-hmm. for them to feed on. And it just, they weren't, they weren't, you know, if there wasn't a mass crop year, they didn't have a whole lot of even browse to, so they, they weren't able to get to the, you know, the antler size and maybe, you know, there's genetics and a whole bunch of other stuff that goes in, involved with that. But it was, uh, it was, it was kind of crazy to me, but when, when so I kind of want to go back to your story. I had some things that I had questions on. So when you, when you mm-hmm. are looking for a track and you're like, okay, it was a pretty good track. What, what do you consider a pretty good track that you think is a mature buck? Like, how do you determine that? Yeah. Oh, well, usually up here, you're looking for a track that the toes are at least three inches long and you got two and a half to three inches wide. Okay. And for me, for me, that's usually what we're looking for. We, we have bigger footed deer up here usually anyway. Mm-hmm. And then you, you'd really like to see the dew claws set right in the snow behind the track too. Mm-hmm. And usually the dew, if it's a big heavy buck, those dew claws will be wider than the track. Okay. And then you're, yeah. And then you're also, not all big bucks will have big feet though. Like, this one I got this year was a 218 pound dress. And I didn't really think he had the biggest foot on him. And the buck I shot last year, I didn't think had the biggest foot in the woods either, but you never know. I, a lot of times I feel like, I don't know what it is, but the bigger rat bucks will have the largest feet. I mean, that could be just coincidence, but yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. And then you also want to look at the stagger between the tracks because a really big mature buck, Usually, especially if they're heavy, we'll have a barrel chest, and that'll make the width between the tracks. It'll be instead of like a doe, some, you'll, it'll look like they're one behind another. Yeah. Whereas a buck, a buck they'll be staggered. Usually, they got an eight to a foot of, between the tracks. And then a really long buck will have a really long stride when he's just walking. Yeah. So like a really, really big long buck will have like a two and a half to three foot stride between his tracks and if you see big if you see it wide and giant stride when he's just walking and then you see those dew claws yeah. you know it's a you know it's a big buck so that's uh, kind of how we do it <laughs> that's 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 interesting i uh i i'd never thought about the long aspect of it that's that's my new yeah. goal i'm not i'm not going for big, i'm looking for a long buck i'm gonna measure heavy- i'm gonna mo- measure the body length and that's gonna be the new uh yeah the heaviest <laughs> The heaviest bucks they get every year in Maine are the long ones. The longer it is, just the more ability you have to pack on weight. And I know every year they shoot something that go, or not every year, but close to 300 pounds dressed up here. And they're always the long one. This guy I got this year was actually a short deer. Uh, a lot of people that saw him were like, yeah, he's got, he's only got the length of like 180 pound deer, but he was so thick. He had the biggest neck of any deer I've ever seen and his shoulders were just massive. He was just a big stocky deer, but he looked like a, you know, like a dead weight lift, one of those weight lifters. Yeah. A power lifter, you know? I, I love the picture that you have of him just laying in the snow. 
that shows his body. Yeah. Like he just oh. looks like a he look yeah, like you say he looks like a power lifter or a tank or a linebacker yeah. or something. Like he just he he's got like a neck roll on, he just looks <laughs> he looks yeah. incredible. I just cut up a doe that my uh, father in law shot on last Saturday on the last day of our rifle season and putting that little doe's neck next to that buck's neck is just it was unbelievable the difference. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, and also, okay. So when you're, when you're going on tracks, do you, do you have any, do you pay attention to the wind at all? Or are you just following the track? Does that matter? No, you... nope. no, I never worry about the only, I never worry about the wind at all when I'm tracking. The only time I might worry about is if I know he's bedded or if I'm, you never know for sure if they're bedded, but if you really think they might be bedded and you have a really strong intuition that, that box bedded right there and the wind's at your back, you might do a loop up around and try to get the wind in your favor and then just kind of still hunt and yep. try to catch them bedded. But other than that, I never worry about where the wind is blowing. I just, just stay on that track. Do you, do you find that they move in a, like when you are tracking them, do you find that they move with say the wind in their face or to their back or does it, does it not really mm. seem to matter as much for them? If they, I think a lot of times they travel with the wind at their face. If if they think nothing's following them, because they're scent checking the does. Yep. So they want they want that wind in their face. But if you jump them one or two times and they they know you're following them, they'll start running with the wind at their back, so they can smell you behind them. They will do that. So that, definitely that makes <laughs> sense. And and you were also talking in that story that I think is a is an important point is you covered like three miles early in the morning. So you were moving relatively quick on that track. Yep. Right. And do yep. you like, how, how do you moderate your speed based on what the track is doing? So what, what you want to do really is you want to look at the track and try to age it. Just decide how old, how far behind that deer you are. And so that's the first thing you got to do. And if you believe it's way ahead of you, because the track's frozen if it's cold out, the track's freezing. If it's warm out, the track's melting. So you got to look at that track and be like, okay, how old is this track? Now I'll tell you how far behind that deer you are. So you almost got to look back at what the weather was all night the previous night. That's usually when they're making the most tracks is during that previous night, when you, if you get on them in the morning. So then you're looking at the track and deciding, okay, how far behind this deer I am. So then you start on the track. And when you first start, you got to go a little slow because you never – done it before where i got on a track first thing in the morning it looked pretty old i started hammering that buck went 200 yards across the road and laid down and i ran right headlong into the deer and jumped him up and then i had a hard day trying to because <laughs> the best time to kill a deer is the first time because once you jump them two or three times they get they know that something's after them and they're way harder to kill them so you got to figure out how far behind and so you start slow and you start following it and most of the time if they're just making a straight straight course through the woods and it looks like they got a pretty good gate you can do the same you can just hammer right along on them pretty much just whatever you a comfortable fast walk i call it like like you were hiking up the trail you know yep just just moving right along keeping your head up don't get caught staring at the track just keep it in your peripheral pay attention to what it's doing but just go right along on that track with your eyes up scanning. And then if anything changes in that track, if he starts doing something, that's when you got to slow down. Like if he stops, he takes a hard turn, he starts to feed. That's when you need to slow right down and you really need to figure out, all right, what's he doing now? Because that's when you got to pay attention. If they start to feed, usually after they feed, they bed down because they got to chew their cut or whatever. Yep. So that's when, if you see them start feeding a lot, usually if they feed a lot, they're going to lay down and they don't lay down. Usually they don't go very far from where they feed to where they lay down. So that's when you go real slow. You just start scanning every little piece of wood, trying to find them just a patch of brown and antler or anything. Or a lot of times if they make a hard turn because they found a doe, they smell the doe. So you got to slow down for a minute and assess. Okay. He made a turn. He's going down into some does. If he gets into a bunch of does, starts chasing, you got to stop, look, or make sure they're not right there. 
because a lot of times they, they find a doe, the doe might not want to go too far. He'll just chase that doe around in circles for half an hour, you know, 45 minutes. Yeah. They might be right there. So you really got to start paying attention then too. But yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense when they get on a doe as far as like spending a lot of time in there. I know from recently getting to hunt West Virginia where I can see a lot more and I'm doing a lot of glassing and, and watching because like when you're in a thick timber, the big woods, you can't really see it unless you, you know, you find mm-hmm. the tracks. But I got to see how much they spend in an area or like they're harassing the doe and the doe will go like hide in a bush or hide in some thick cover and he's harassing her a little bit and then he gets her up and she might run – hundred yards mm-hmm. and try to hide again. And like, they do this, you know, thing back yep. and forth, um, in, in, um, uh, a particular area, um, for a while. So that, that makes a lot of sense. But one thing I heard how blood say before and line kind of what, what you're saying there is like, you know, if you, if you spend the whole day, like you're still hunting when you're tracking, you'll never, you'll never catch up to the buck and you'll just, you won't cover very much ground. And, and my dad's taught me that even with still, even with still hunting though, is like trying to move faster, the pri- the low priority areas, you know, some of the open woods and stuff that, you know, they don't think they're going to be bedded down or whatever at, and then, you know, take your time in those, the thickets or whatever else that might, you know, th- that's where you need to, to, you know, when you think you're going slow, go slower and, and be looking out ahead and trying to, trying to catch them there. So that, that makes a lot of sense as far as that goes. And, and I, and I do think like, even though like our gun season down here in Pennsylvania and some other places are in December and, you know, one, they do have kind of the secondary rut that they come into, but even if they're not rutting, I think you get some snow. I think the tracking can be a really good, a really useful tactic and even later in the season in January, um, yeah. maybe they're not going as far, you know, as far as looking for does, but I, I think that it can be such a useful tactic to be able to use. Yeah. Yeah. Come late season. It's, it's a little harder to find a track because they're not putting on the miles looking for does. But like, if you know an area where they're known to hang out late season, you can go in there and find a track and it's, it's actually easier to track in late season because they're tired and, they don't want to run. They don't want to run, half, you know, 10 miles across the country. They just want to, they're recuperating from the rut. So yep. they're feeding, they're laying down, they're just taking it easy. And yeah, it's a great, it's a great time to track a buck. Late, early season too, because they're not going too far. Just finding the tracks is the hard part. Yeah. And what, so, okay. So if you can't say, uh, you drive the roads and you're not able to find a track, you know, near the roads or anything. How do you put a game plan together to go into an area yeah. um, to find a track? Like, are you, are you heading for a specific area um, based off sign you've scouted or like how, where, where are you starting to, to actually look for that track? Yeah. Usually it's, usually it's areas I've scouted in the past that I know that they like to use. Um, so that's, that comes the early season when I'm still hunting and in October when I'm finding, looking for doe pockets. If I find a doe pocket somewhere where I know there's a bunch of deer, I'll go, go to that area and try to find a track. And then, so yeah, if I can't find one from the road, usually I'll just, I'll have a spot in mind and I'll just park the truck, do a big loop around a ridge or around a, you know, up a, up a river or up a brook and then back around up a ridge or whatever. And see what I can find and then occasionally I'll just pick a spot on a map that I think looks pretty good and then I'll do a big loop up in there because I don't know I feel like a lot of times the first time you go into a place you don't have any preconceived notions or anything like that and you just hunt it a little bit better oh you, I know sometimes oh, you, you just, definitely do oh you get you get these thoughts in your head like the deer are going to be right here and so I, I love going into a spot for the first time it, plus the mystery too that you you might see something that yeah. You know, you know, something crazy. But Oh, I, yeah. I handicap myself so much when I know an area so well that yeah. I, I tiptoe through it because I um you know, always thinking like, Oh, I you know, or or I might go past an area that normally you know if it was a new area i might hunt a little differently and you know because like oh i never saw a deer in here before i don't have any pictures or i never found much sign and and it, it I, I don't know i hunt areas better for the first time <clears throat> than i do if if i have a lot of well, especially when i'm you know hunting on the ground or doing you know that that kind of style and, and that's why like for me during gun season when i still have a tag because we're a one buck state too so if i still have a tag in gun season i really like going to areas that i 
don't typically hunt in archery just because it's, I, I just hunt it differently. Like the couple of bucks that I've, I've shot in gun season over the last six years have been like just running ridges and, and, and moving. And, and a lot of times too, is like, I know in NPA, like the, the deer will go down in the creek bottoms at night and I'm not sure what the, exactly how the terrain looks where you're at, but you know, even in areas that have, that don't have like, you know, giant hills or mountains or anything, but they'll go down those creek bottoms and feed in some of those grasses and stuff at night and then go back mm-hmm. up into the, the hills, you know, in the morning to bed. But if you run those creek bottoms in the snow, you can find those tracks and kind of follow them back up to, to where it, it's just a good place to be able to find a track, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Our trains, our trains pretty similar. Usually a lot of times the deer like to bed on these ridges. We don't have, we do have some pretty big mountains in Maine. They're not nothing huge, but our average mountain around here is, you know, 2,000, 2,000 feet, 2,500 feet, the yeah. average hill. We we have some 4,000 footers, but most of the time it's just a lot of rolling hills and mountains. Yep. But, uh, yeah, they like to bed on those hills and go down, like you said, in the night feed. A lot of our feeding, it's based on the logging. There's so much cutting around here with the clear cuts and all that, that it's that's like their ag up, up here so i spend a lot of time hunting around those cuts and i like to walk up the edges of those cuts a lot of times you'll get they'll cut the side of a mountain and uh they'll cut the hardwood off the lower section of the mountain and then at the top there'll be softwood and those deer love to bed three quarters up on those hills in the softwood and then come down at night and feed in those cuts yep and uh they're they can be awful to walk through, but I like to go up the edge where they stop cutting because you they'll have ed- on the edge there'll be some big woods still. Travel up those edges. The bucks love to run those edges too. Yep. And uh, you just go up those edges to where you get up into the soft woods and then you can kind of hunt along the hunt along the top. But yeah, yeah and, those are good spots. And we um so like uh you know a lot of the mm-hmm. areas that I hunt and stuff are. They, they do a lot of cutting too. And, and, and also the luckily being local, I know a lot of a lot, there's a huge logging community. So I know a lot of loggers and I'll talk to them too, as far as where they're cutting yeah. at. And, you know, like, especially when it comes like later in the year and it's getting colder and there's snow on the ground, they're like, by the time they, they shunt, shut their equipment off, you know, they have deer feeding already on the tops oh, yeah. and everything. So <laughs> it's like, I, yeah. I had information on that the one year I didn't, I didn't know this logger specifically, but I was going in there scouting on, it was Thanksgiving morning actually. And our season was opening in a couple of days and, and, um, I was driving along and I ran into a logger coming out and he's, I'm like, what are you seeing for deer? He's like, Oh, they're, he goes, I don't even have my equipment off yet. And they're coming in. He goes, there's a nice buck in here. And I happened to drive down the road and I saw him and it was middle of the day. He was out there feeding uh, yep. with some does and i was like okay and i came in and <laughs> i ended up missing that buck uh uh the first day of, oh. of gun season but it was it was just like that those logging cuts just are oh yeah, yeah. They, they are people One. magnets too but they you know they yep. but when you have a bunch of them it, and you, yeah. if you're, you're willing to you know check a whole bunch a lot of them you can you can find them yeah they're definitely people like to hunt them but there's so many up here that and our, we really don't have that much hunting pressure. We have some hunting pressure, but nothing like down where you are. Yeah. I mean, we're just, there's not that many people up here. We have a lot of out-of-staters that come to hunt Maine, especially especially the Vermonters. They'll get a kick out of that if they listen to this. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they love, they love to come to Maine. They don't cut enough wood in Vermont or something, so they all, they all come to Maine to chase deer. But, yeah, well, I think that's one, of the reasons, that's one of the reasons we get a lot of big deer in Maine, though. Is because of all the cutting. Without that cutting, there, there just wouldn't be much for feed up, up there, and it helps them grow these racks. Yeah, mm-hmm. I I agree, and 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 I I've said it before, but like one when I was talking about that area that I went to that was really remote, but didn't have like big antler deer. It was, it was there's no there's no logging there, and it was like when I the correlation I found is areas that have a lot of logging have bigger deer. It's just they have the yeah. feed year round. You know, they have the brows, they have the tops when they're younger, they have the briars, they have everything that's in there that's just, it uh, has everything that the deer need and uh, just, it 
it makes a it makes a whole lot of sense but it's funny you say that about vermont because when i was doing uh deer research for spartan forage i was looking at vermont and i was like man there's not a when i'm looking at the the data i was like there's not a whole lot that makes me want to have put vermont <laughs> on the list of places i want to go to <laughs> yeah i don't for some re- for some reason they there's some good deer there but for some reason they just don't they don't grow the same way they do in like new hampshire and maine and yeah. massachusetts and I think it has to do a lot with the, uh, the environment there. They just, I don't know what it is exactly, but yeah, they don't grow the same class of bucks that the states all around them do. do- but there's some ser- but there's some awesome hunters from Vermont. That Benoit tradition is strong there. They, they come up to Maine and they shoot some great bucks and all the locals. <laughs> yeah, we chuck we chuckle about it. The green plates invade Maine every year, but <laughs> yeah, that is, that is funny. Does um, yeah. so so uh, what about like when you do have the out of staters come up and stuff like that? That the paper company property and stuff is that open to public hunting, or do you need like permission to hunt that? No, most a lot of it's open, just just open to general use. We do have an area in Maine called the North Maine Woods, which is. Uh, they do have a day use fee up there and a camping fee. Uh, I think it runs. I haven't been up there in a few years. I hunt a little bit further. I shouldn't give away my secret. Yeah, don't, 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 don't. Say I hunt a little else. further. I hunt a little further south than the North Main Woods because I think you get a better class of bucks. Not always. The heaviest bucks are shot up the north, usually in the North Main Woods. But uh, for Antler Grove, I like to hunt a little further south. But uh, yeah, I think pretty sure it runs into November. They still have a day use fee. It's it's pretty cheap though. Yeah. That, that's, that's cause I mean, I know in Pennsylvania we have that a lot. Like we have a lot of land, we have a lot of public land. That's your traditional national forest, state forest, state game lands. But we also have a lot of timber company properties, paper company property, all that stuff that's, that's just open to public hunting, but yep. you know, not, not as many people know about it. If, if you're not local or don't, Mm-hmm. you know understand i mean if you go drive up to the gates they'll have signs that say you know open to public hunting or whatever but uh yep. um i i was wondering how that that worked up there and is there is there many guide services like i know hal has you know the guide service up there and and yeah, stuff there's, there's a few um i think it's getting more more popular um i just became a registered main guide just this year so i'm gonna be looking to do it in the future here nice have, it's hard right now because I love to hunt so much that I really don't want to give them. And I have two young kids. I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old. So it's kind of tough to leave and go up there all for a whole month in November and guide and then hunt, want to hunt on my own and all that. But I think in the future, I'm gonna, I want to do some guiding. And uh, I actually, I don't know what kind of interest is going to be, but I kind of want to do like a, if guys that want to come up DIY, I'd like to set up like get a wall tent set up for them get it all set up with wood stove and wood. And so all they got to do, I'll have it all pre-scouted. They come up, they hunt. They got a place to stay. They can do it themselves. I'll point them in their own direct. I'll point them in some good spots, but if they don't want a fully guided hunt, that they can just come up and uh, stay in a wall tent. Yeah. Almost like a semi guided drop, drop yeah. camp style. Like you see out yeah. west. Yeah. No, that's, yep. yeah, that would be a, that'd be a cool option as far as, especially for people like, you know, say someone coming from Pennsylvania and, or Vermont and, uh, yep. you don't get the time to get up there and scout yourself or whatever, but you still want to exactly. have that experience. It can help you if you have five days off of work or whatever yep. to, to, to be yeah. able to do that. Yeah. Cause you, it can take, a lot of guys that come up here for a week and it's hard in a week, especially with no snow. If there's no snow and you only have a week, a lot of times it can take two, three, four days to find with the deer, find a good pocket of deer, and then you can start hunting. But with snow, it's a little easier because you can just go look for that track and then follow it. But yeah, yeah a little scouting helps a lot. Oh yeah. No, it, <laughs> it, yeah. It makes a, the world a difference. You know, I mean, I, I've always said I'm lucky that, that I've been able to grow up in an area of big woods that I can go, I, you know, would always scout after work or weekends mm-hmm. or whatever. Like I was always scouting and still I'm always scouting. So it's like, I, I can't imagine trying to, to go up just, you know, blind and, and trying to figure yeah. it out in a short amount of time. It can be done. It's just, it's just harder. Yep. You gotta, you gotta spend more days scouting than you do actually hunting at that point. Yep. I know. I keep telling my wife, I want to move. But <laughs> I, we like where we live now. It's only about two to three, 
it depends where I hunt, but two to three hours to drive up to the big woods. So it's not too bad. And do you get uh, some more flexibility as far as with being a logger, um, with being yeah. able to hunt? Yeah, we actually, like I said, my, my family, we're all crazy about deer hunting. So we all take, we all take time off from work come November. We rotation, we call it. And yeah. Yeah. We all go hunting. Yeah, my brother and my father have both shot some awesome bucks too. They're more of a stand hunters. Yep. Yeah, but they love it. Yeah, they love it too. <laughs> oh no, that's that's awesome. I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I was talking um, a buddy of mine that lives in New Hampshire, Brett Joy, and and he does a little bit of a mixture of stand hunting in November, but yep. he also likes oh, yeah. to track too. And uh, and he's been inviting me to come up and and do it and i i just i need to i just need to make it happen but it's it's yeah. on a it's on a uh the top of a long list of places i want to go but it's yeah. it's, it's up there as far yeah, as you uh, definitely need to make it happen yeah you definitely should yeah i follow brett yeah he's a he's a great hunter yeah uh, yeah he just had a, just did his week annual week long sit in new hampshire he had a hard one this year but he usually does pretty good yeah. I don't know how he does. I don't know how he does those seven day all seven in a row all day sit, but <laughs> I, I love, I, and, uh, so Brett and I always, he, he always texts me back and forth during like these time periods. And like, I loved seeing his stories this year on Instagram where it was like, you know, day yeah. six, this many hours long, one deer. <laughs> it's like not yeah. many people can do that. And, and it, it no. pays off for him. Um, he, oh, yeah. he always, he always pulls through and it's just, it's hard. <laughs> it is hard, but you get, you get in those areas and they're good. It's just a matter of time before a big buck rolls through there. It's just sometimes the timing is just a little bit off, but it, it, but you don't know it's what's, effective. What's what's neat about deer hunting though is that you can kind of play into your strengths and what you like to do. Like for you, you don't like to sit and you like to 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 walk, so mm -hmm. you're able to do that and stay on that pattern where there's people that like to sit and like to to do that. Like I kind of I kind of have a mixture. I can sit. A while when I need to, and I will sit a week mm -hmm. straight if I have to. But then it comes down to like a certain point in the season. I'm just like, I just want to, <laughs> I want to do something <laughs> else. I want to move, you know. I want to, yeah. I want to uh, still hunt yeah. or, or do that. So it's 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 kind of cool. I'm I'm looking yeah. forward to. Um, um, I'm saving one of my doe tags for our late flintlock season. So hopefully we have some snow and I've always wanted to kill one with a flintlock muzzle. Mm. And, uh, I, I want to, I'd love to do it tracking even with a doe, like just, it'd be fun to, oh, yeah. to, to be able to, to do that and just different than, you know, the traditional archery hunting that I, that I do a lot of. So, yeah, even, even tracking a doe, you you'd learn so much about track and how to age the track and when they're going to lay, when they're getting ready to lay down and all that, you pick, you pick up on it pretty quick. I bet. You know, and, and, and I've <laughs> said this a lot, but I think people that track deer are some of the best woodsmen that, that I've ever met because you have to pick up on so many things. Like you have to, you know, we were talking about it earlier. It's not easy to look at a track and determine how old it is or determine how fast it's going or determine how big it is or, or determine when they're about to lay down. And there's, you're always kind of got to be analyzing these things. And, you know, at, as you get more experience, your gut helps you make a little bit of those decisions, but it's not, it's not simple yeah. to, to be able no. to do at all. Yeah, no, definitely. It's tracking a buck teaches you. So it's like the most, the best scouting tool you could ever imagine too, because, they show you every little nook and cranny of their territory and they'll show you where they cross the brook and they'll show you where they walk up the mountain. And yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I wish there was snow all, I wish there was snow all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, well, kind of. Only yeah, hunters, so. only hunters say yeah. that. Nobody I else know. says that. Actually, no. One time season is over, it can go away, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. I was like, yeah, I was like, after yeah. like the first week of January or so, I'm okay yeah, if the snow would fine. just disappear. That would be, yeah, that would be fine. nice. Then I can get out and start looking for shed antlers and scouting again. Uh, but I'm always our snow like seems to just last longer every year. Like this year, we still had some on the ground in April. I'm like, but there's shed antlers out there. I'm trying to get out and look mm -hmm. for them, and uh, and trying to find scrapes and all this stuff. And the snow is really putting a damper on that. <laughs> oh yeah yeah usually up usually up north around here it lasts 
till the end of April, sometimes really? into May. Yeah, it's brutal. It's a uh, long, long, it's a long cold winter, but <laughs> yeah. that's what makes us enjoy the makes us enjoy the good weather that much more. I guess. Yeah, no, definitely. Yep. And it it seems like that you guys just have just beautiful country up that way. I mean, I've I've never spent any time really up in the northeast, which is so crazy to me because it's really not that far away. Um, nope. but it's just it just seems like such a beautiful area. Yeah, like I, I haven't done a whole lot of traveling, I mean, but I just love Maine. Yeah. Probably why I haven't that's why I probably haven't done much traveling cuz everything I've ever wanted, I guess is right here, so but yeah, that's I awesome. love it. I love it. Well, cool. I, I appreciate you coming on and, and telling your story a little bit and, and talking just about just tracking and, and deer behavior. Like I, I just, I don't know. I think that's so, so invaluable. And that's why I was like, um, and I actually had you, even before you shot this buck, I had your name written down on a, uh, thing oh, yeah. from talking to you before I wanted to, to get yeah. you on and talk. And, and then, uh, when you sent me that, that picture i was like man i need that and the story i was like I, I need to get just make it happen and get you on so i was i was excited to to be able to do that awesome awesome thanks yeah no i love love the podcast i like following what you do glad you had me on yeah i appreciate that is, is there any place that you would like to send anybody to to follow along and check out some of your pictures and all that stuff yeah pretty much all my hunting stuff is on my Instagram. Uh, I'm on my Instagram. I'm Jim Bob Grady. Pretty easy. Yep. 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 And I'll, I'll have links in the in the show notes and then and the stuff on Instagram there, so people will be able to find that. And uh, uh, there was something else. Oh, and and then uh, once your once your guiding service is up and running, that's probably where they can find that information as well. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm I'm a newbie at that. I just got registered. Uh, trying to get all that figured out but if, if if anyone's interested in anything i talked about just hit me up on instagram i don't have a website or anything like that yet but you can message anyone can message me on instagram about anything i'm open book too so if anyone wants to ask questions about maine or tracking or whatever i'm open book awesome again yep. thank you so much for coming on man and yep. uh yeah uh enjoy enjoy the snow enjoy if you get back out deer hunting anymore okay. Will and do. uh i'll talk to you later all right. Thanks, Bo. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.